so happy today to have the second in our series of learning uh, venues. Last week we learned by online learning, and today we're going to be in the classroom. Uh, again, I am so happy for Taka, and I'm going to read my own writing instead of printed word as I tell you about Joe. I've known Joe for quite a few years. I'm not going to tell you how many because I'm 35 today. <laughs> Joe Rule received his bachelor's and master's degree at Purdue University, and he has been sharing the joys of biology with kids for 38 years. He presently teaches biology, genetics, and science research courses at Jefferson High School in Lafayette. Joe and his wife, Gail, have two children and two grandchildren, with a third one due in October. This isn't in the script, but I enrolled his son-in-law in an online course years ago, so I have a little tie to the rural family. The National Association of Biology Teachers named Joe Rule the Outstanding Biology Teacher of Indiana in 1987. In 1988, he was awarded a Golden Apple Teaching Award by the Lafayette, Indiana Chamber of Commerce. In 1989, he was honored at the White House and is Indiana's recipient of the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Teaching. Are you impressed yet? In 1996, he received the Purdue University College of Science Distinguished Alumnus Award for Excellence in K-12 Science Teaching. In 2004, he was awarded the Purdue College of Education Crystal Apple Teaching Award. And in 2012, he was honored with the, Nash with the Shell National Science Teaching Award. Today, we are honored to have Joe Rule. Uh, well, can, you, can you be heard out here? Can you hear me out there? Oh, yes. yes. How long am I supposed to talk? <laughs> well, 30 minutes at least. At least? At least. No. <laughs> to school is nothing like what I had today. And so this was wonderful. And, and the other, there's something I've noticed. <clears throat> I, I started looking around the room when I first arrived here. And I now know why so many people in this room are smiling or have been smiling in our time here today. I know why now. This is a service organization. And I thank you for all the good work you do in this community. I sincerely mean that. And I know why you're smiling and why there's so much laughter in this place. Because uh, brain research now is telling us that our brains are wired for giving and living a life of service. Our brains are wired for that. And when we are doing those kinds of things, that's when we feel most fulfilled because it stimulates pleasure centers in the brain. Isn't that kind of interesting? That that's what we're made for. Lives of service and giving. That's why I see so many smiles in here. I'm convinced of it. And I just thank you for the good work that you do. Now, I've been teaching at Jefferson High School since 1984. And so I've kind of got the hang of it. <laughs> but I learn new things every year. Uh, the learning never stops. And I fell in love with biology. Oh, gosh. It was the fall of 1973. 
I was a freshman at Purdue University. I've always had an interest in science, but I was in a botany course, Botany 108, a biology course. The professor was Dr. Sam Postlewaite. Anybody yeah. know him? Yeah. And I had always had an interest in science, but when I got into that course, I fell in love with biology. And I even took an interest in teaching because of the unique nature and the way Sam had that course set up. It just caught my attention and motivated me and, and inspired me. So, thank you for the mentor that you are. And the, I had other outstanding mentors at Purdue, and, and after my experience at Purdue, I thought, I said to myself, self, I want a mentor too. I, I want to do more than just teach biology. I want to inspire kids and maybe even get them to love biology. And so that's what I do. And you see, it's much more than just teaching biology. I, I kind of want to pass it on. I want kids to get excited about learning. And it's fun when they do get excited about learning. I really think, and I've told my mama this, I really think that I have one of the best jobs in the world because I get to work with people who are fun, funny, energetic, creative, and insightful. Now, they happen to be 14 to 18 years of age, but the energy level, let me tell you, you know, you better have your running shoes on to keep up with the kids. And, and it seems like so many times the kids who make bad decisions are the ones who make the news. And, and if all we do is read the newspaper or watch the news, we may get an inaccurate view of what kids today are like. But I'm telling you, and you probably know this already because you, you serve the community. The vast majority of our kids are just awesome and wonderful, and they're eager to learn. They're full of energy. They're full of great ideas. They're going to they're gonna continue where the rest of us have left off, and the world is going to be in great shape. These kids are great. And I just want to share some pictures of some of my kids so you can meet some of them. <clears throat> I don't... I won't use many names, but I'm just going to go through a bunch of slides real quickly here. And um, so, like I said, I, this is my 38th year of teaching, and I, I think the math is correct. I taught one year in Macon, Georgia, and then I taught a year up in La Crosse, Indiana. Does anybody know where La Crosse, Indiana is? Tiny little town. 150 kids in the upper four grades. And um, <clears throat> that was a wonderful experience. But this whole time, I was trying to get back closer to West Lafayette. So Macon, Georgia, then La Crosse, Indiana. And then I got a job at Monon, Indiana, North White High School. I was there four years. <laughs> Kept trying to get closer to West Lafayette because there was a young lady living down here. <laughs> who I've been married to now since 1981, uh, Gail Rule. She, she works in the Botany and Plant Pathology Department at Purdue. She's a plant disease diagnostician. And so uh, four years at North White, and then a job opened up at Jefferson High School in 1984, and I've been there ever since. The other night at, parent, at uh, Open House, parents were coming in, parents of my students, and there were several parents who looked at me and said, Mr. Rule, do you remember me? <laughs> and that, you know, that's just a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember you. <laughs> Had you in class back you know, some time ago. And it's just so much fun being, living in a wonderful community. Nod your head yes if you think that the greater Lafayette area is just a wonderful place. It's a, it's, it's, uh, we're blessed. Because it seems to me everywhere you go in West Lafayette, Lafayette, this, this area, it's, um, well, compared to where I grew up. Anybody ever heard of Star City, Indiana? Okay, I grew up out in the country near Star City, Indiana. Went to Winnemac High School. Uh, 
And so, compared to where I grew up, Lafayette is big city. Okay? But yet, everywhere you go, it's got a small town feel. You know what I mean? It's just a great place to live, and, and we're, I think we're blessed. And why did I get into that? I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. <laughs> so um, I just am really thrilled to be here in this town. It's been a great place to raise our kids and, uh, and to work as well. Made a lot of friends over the years. Lots of students, lots of former students. A couple years ago, my wife and I were out at the mall at Christmas time. And you know how the mall is around that time of year. Lots of people coming and going. Uh, a, a young lady walked up. She's pushing a stroller. And there's a baby in the stroller. She has a little toddler in tow. And this young lady came up to me and said, Mr. Rule, do you remember me? <coughs> I had, had her in class years ago. And I said, oh, yes, I remember you. You were in my biology class. And you know what she said? She said, Mr. Rule, it's so good to see you're still getting around. <laughs> it made my heart leap. My heart leapt with joy. I just, I just, you know, kids sometimes have this view of people that's just. I said, well, it's good to be getting around. <laughs> so, anyway, you already know I teach at Jefferson High School, and. Um, I, I teach several courses. One of the courses is biology, and it's a lot like honors biology. And then I also teach honors biology, and these are ninth graders. And it was really interesting, at the beginning of the school year, we always do a, I always do with my kids a get acquainted activity, and I find out their birthdays, and, and all this kind of thing. And, and it struck me and it amazed me that these ninth graders were born about what, 2000, 2001. I mean, think about that. That's when they were born. They don't even remember 9 11. They were born, they were babies. Um, time flies, it just really flies. But uh, so, in honors biology, we're talking about ninth graders, and I just have a passion for biology. I just really enjoy it. And what I try to get across to my kids, my students, so when I say my kids, I'm talking about my students. What I try to get across to my kids is find what you enjoy doing in life. Find what you enjoy doing. Find what you're passionate about. And then Go into it with a, a servant attitude. It's all about other people. And this is all about the kids. And what I really enjoy doing is going in, you know, a few weeks before school starts and getting the biology classroom ready. Uh, I feel very blessed and fortunate to be teaching biology because it's all about life, the study of living things. And so I enjoy just fixing the room up with aquariums and cages and critters of all kinds, so that when the kids come in, they look around and they go, oh, well, this is interesting, I want to be in here. And so, um, several years ago, we remodeled the science department at Jefferson High School, and I remember this crew coming around and asking me, well, they said to me, Mr. Rule, it's time for you to pick out your new office furniture for the remodeling. And I said, can I get something else instead of new office furniture? And they said, well, if you want to keep your old office furniture, that's okay. So I got this 300-gallon aquarium, <laughs> freshwater aquarium, and it's just a real hit with the kids. They come in, and uh, they just start asking all kinds of questions. And so many times we'll refer to this, and we'll go back to this when we're talking about, oh, photosynthesis or nutrient cycling or... or um, predator-prey relationships or food chains, it, it gets used a lot in a lot of things that we talk about. Um, so this is just, oh, and saltwater also, saltwater aquaria. Uh, our kids, many of them have not been to the ocean, and so I thought, well, let's bring a little bit of the ocean to Lafayette, Indiana, so they can experience it. And uh, 
Oh, this is this little guy. This is an axolotl. It's kind of interesting. It raises lots of questions in their minds. So it's a menagerie when they walk in there. Lots of critters. It's a lot of work, but it's fun, and it makes it interesting for the kids. Um, oh, this is a little corn snake named Fuego, which uh, <laughs> means fire in Spanish. And, uh, the kids enjoy Fuego and gerbils, of course. So. The room is full of life. Sorry about this picture just after lunch. Um, these are Ascaris roundworms preserved in, in alcohol. Sorry about that. This is not a good <laughs> But you all can take it, right? <laughs> Lunchtime photo here. And uh, oh, microscopic life as well. This young man is working in a lab activity where he's basically taking a safari through. A celery bog pond water. You'd be surprised <laughs> what exists in celery bog pond water. All kinds of tiny microscopic organisms, and the kids are just enthralled by that. It's one of the early activities in the school year that I used to get them hooked, just to get them hooked. So this is just uh, you know views of kids. Oh, Madagascar hissing cockroaches, courtesy Tom Turpin in the Purdue Entomology <laughs> Department. He gave me a half a dozen about 30 years ago, and they just reproduce like crazy, and so when we're learning about reproduction, we've got a good example right there, and uh, my colony's been going for a long, long time. Fossil skull, well, those aren't real fossil skulls. They'd be too expensive. They're plastic reconstructions. And so I borrowed a lot of ideas from Sam Postal. He influenced me greatly. Hands-on, minds-on, learning, inquiry-based. Lots of student activity. Uh, lots of moving around. Lots of kids doing. I learned a long time ago that we learn more from the things that we do from the things that we hear. And I try to implement that. And uh, the kids seem to get into it. And uh, here's some other views of kids working on lab activities. These are ninth graders, as I mentioned. And, uh, one thing I've done over the years, and it's only because it's kind of a hobby. It's fun for me. There, was, there, there is a man at Purdue in the biology department named Dr. Clark Gedney. Does anybody know Clark Gedney? Okay. He taught me years ago how to create these interactive computer lessons. Got the original idea from Sam back in the night, early 1970s. Back in those days, I remember in that course when I was a freshman at Purdue, I'd go sit in a booth with a tape recorder and headphones and a, a study guide, and I would listen to the tape and stop the tape when I needed to, or rewind, or what, I did a lot of rewinding, <laughs> to, to pick up what I had missed and fill out that study guide. I could go at my own pace, and I loved that. And periodically, I'd turn the tape off and get up and go do, look at some demonstration and do some hands-on activity. And a lot of those ideas, you see, I got from Sam. Uh, we don't, I don't use booths with tape recorders anymore. I've got 10 computers around the perimeter of my classroom with headphones hooked up to them. And so Dr. Clark Gedney taught me years ago how to create these interactive computer lessons with sounds and video clips and checks for understanding and all that kind of stuff. And so the kids work through these computer lessons that I've developed during summer times, <laughs> during the summertime. And they go, they can go at their own pace. They fill out a study guide as they work. So sound familiar, Sam? It, it's just taking the place of the booth with the tape recorder. And um, this is how they get the main content in ninth grade. I still lecture once in a while, but a lot of these computer lessons I built to take the place of stuff that I used to lecture on. And kids have told me in private, because they wouldn't tell this publicly, right? Mr. Rule, we like the computer lessons better than your lectures. <laughs> and, you know, I figure that's okay, because... It's all about them. I mean, that's what we're here for, the kids. So here you can see some kids working on those computer lessons. And uh, 
Okay. Well, sometimes they also will work on online activities, interactive online activities, and they're responsible for filling out information that they gather, and then they turn that in. And uh, so this is a little bit what it looks like. And there's a lot of group work that happens on some of the activities that they do. Um, lots of activity. And this just gives you kind of a glimpse. Um, these are, like I said, these are ninth graders. They're just 14 and 15 years old. And so you can see. Uh, there are times when they have to present publicly. That's a good skill for anybody, no matter what they're going into. Good to see all the women, young the, I mean, ladies in the honors. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, I have a question. Yes. Do you still cut up frogs in ninth grade? Uh, believe it or not, we don't. But we have a zoology course, which is a second year biology course, that a lot of kids take. And in that course, they dissect representative organisms of the entire animal kingdom. It's, um, and so they get that experience in there. Uh, there's so much in modern biology nowadays that a lot of the dissections have kind of fallen by the wayside. How much is required and how much is elective at that particular age level? At ninth, ninth grade? Required biology? Uh, Biology is required, and that's statewide, state of Indiana. It's a, it's a required course for graduation. Um, in terms of science courses in the state of Indiana, students must take and pass a biology course, and then a course in the physical sciences. It can either be chemistry or physics. And then a third year of any science course. So it could be, uh, well, physics if they didn't take chemistry or vice versa, or earth science, or astronomy, or zoology, or genetics. Um, so we have a lot of different upper level electives after they take biology as ninth graders. So I, oh, I also teach this genetics course, and this is a second year biology course. These are juniors and seniors. It's an elective, and the emphasis is on human genetics because really principles of genetics apply to all living things, but we use mostly human examples because that's what kids tend to be most interested in, humans. and so. This is just a photo that I found of a genetics class from years ago. Um, oh, and here are a couple girls who were in the course just a couple years ago. They're sisters, and they did a special project. Special projects can be part of the course. And these two young ladies decided to demonstrate, in I think a very creative way, the fact that they each inherited half of their genes from mom, and half of their genes from dad. So, uh, I just thought, I just got a real kick out of that. So, they're handy with a sewing machine, and I don't know if mom and dad knew what, were, what was happening to their genes or not, but they ended up in this demonstration. Um, some of you may know the parents of these two young ladies. The, uh, their last name is Lacey, and their parents own Great Harvest Bread Store over in Lafayette. Wonderful place. Raise your hand if you've ever been there. Oh, yeah. They have these cinnamon rolls that are, oh, they're about like this. And they're heavy and syrupy. And, and she told me that there's actually 900 calories in each one. I mean, that's like... That's a day. That's a day's worth of calorie oil for some people. Um, and these are some of the kids. Uh, one of the options that they have at the end of each nine weeks is to design and decorate a genetics t-shirt to demonstrate something they've learned. And, and some of you may know Bernie Tao. Anybody know Bernie Tao? Well, this is actually his son right here. Uh, this was several years ago. I love his shirt. I love DNA. Uh, this is Greg Tao. He actually 
he went to MIT, and I've, I've kind of lost track of him, but uh, this, they're just really interesting, fun kids who take this course. Like I said, it's an elective. Genetics is an elective. Second semester, we do a lot of molecular labs, and they, they actually get to do their own DNA fingerprints, the real thing. So, needless to say, since I graduated from Purdue in 1977, I have had to keep learning. Because when I graduated from Purdue in 1977, nobody knew anything about, well, very few people knew anything about DNA fingerprinting. I mean, the, the field has grown tremendously, and genetics changes all the time. And so I love the challenge of trying to keep up. And it is a real challenge. And the kids really get into it. I think there's so many topics in human genetics and medical genetics that are relevant. And uh, it's just a fun course to teach. And here are some more of those students. Oh, this young man here, um, he's working on a PhD now at Purdue in uh, nuclear engineering. And speaking, his name is Alex Hagen. His dad looked at my knee not long ago. <laughs> Great family, wonderful family. Uh, let's see what I mean. It's like, okay, big city compared to what I grew up in. But small town, everywhere you go, it's got that small town feel. And uh, so he's working on a PhD right now. So some of these pictures go back quite a ways. Oh, this young lady right here, okay, this does go back a ways because she kind of made a name for herself at Purdue. Here she is, Ruth Hegarty Pinto, was introduced to Purdue Agriculture Research Lab through a high school program that pairs professors with local science students. And so she went on to do great things at Purdue, and I think, I don't know what she's doing, I lost track, but great things professionally as well. And um, hometown girl makes good. What I've noticed about kids, there are so many great kids. Now, at Jefferson High School, we have all kinds of kids. Yeah. All kinds. <laughs> We've got kids who <laughs> might be president of the United States someday. Who knows? Or president of Purdue University. Um, might find a cure for breast cancer. Who knows? We've got, but on the other end, we've also got kids who don't like school. We've got kids who are homeless at Jefferson High School. So the thing I love about the school is it is a true cross section of all of society. And uh, my heart goes out for some of the kids. You know, some come from very supportive families, some come from really tough family situations and um, a person can get discouraged if they if they try to look too much at the big pic picture instead of looking at one kid at a time okay so I also teach this course called science research and this is a course that's a little bit different it's a project course and these are juniors and seniors also these are kids who are interested in science or engineering as a career possibility and what I do is I spend a couple <clears throat> months in the summertime pairing each student up with a mentor at Purdue. And so right now I have 15 students in that course. And each student works with a mentor at Purdue University in a lab, a research lab, connected to what that particular student is interested in. So I find out in the spring, what are you, what are you interested in? Botany. Or chemical engineering. And so during the summer, I find a mentor, a researcher, that that student can go work in that lab as an apprentice, a research apprentice. And this has been quite rewarding. These kids get to the end of the school year, and they present the results of their research projects at Purdue. And they're, they're explaining their projects to me. And if it's in an area other than biology, if it's in chemical engineering, or nuclear engineering, or pharmacy, some area that I'm not trained in, it goes right over my head. And that's okay. You know, you, you find these good, talented kids, and you just point them in the right direction. 
And it's amazing what they end up doing. It just, uh, and I learned from them. Uh, here's a young lady. These photos I took, Tom, at the Regional Science Fair over in uh, Stewart Center. This young lady worked on a project in microbiology uh, where she was studying uh, nasty little germs that sometimes reside in uh, delicatessens. And it was a microbiology project. Uh, and here's a young lady who did a project involving uh, calcium and vitamin D in bones. She worked with Connie Weaver, Weaver over in the Department of uh, Foods and Nutrition. And uh, this young lady, Emily Erickson, well, this was a long time ago. She's a senior at Purdue now. She just went to Oxford, too. Yeah. She just left. She finished yeah. up. How oh, long time no see. Yeah, Emily, um, here's the thing about Emily Erickson. <clears throat> um, she made the news recently. It says, Emily Erickson, a Purdue University senior from Clarks Hill, Indiana, has won the Churchill Scholarship. Uh, now, she, she's from Clarks Hill, Indiana, but she and her family um, have chosen to, to come to Jeff, so I think sometimes school choice is a good thing. Uh, but I had her in the genetics class, and I also had her in uh, the science research class. It says, only 14 students nationwide received this competitive award, which funds a one-year graduate degree in science, engineering, or mathematics, at Churchill College at University of Cambridge in Great Britain. I'm so proud of her. You know? You just, you just find these great kids and you point them in the right direction. That's what you do. And it is just so much fun to see them go off and do what they do. Oh my goodness. I just... Uh, Purdue is the only university in the country to have two Churchill Scholarship finalists, Purdue President Mitch Daniels said. So these kids, just point them in the right direction. Uh, they're quite talented. Here's a young man who, uh, when he was in this research course, he actually programmed Purdue's uh, cosmic ray detector in the physics department. He came to me and he said, Mr. Rule, I want to do something in computer programming. So I got him hooked up with a professor in the physics department, and that's what he did. Last time I heard, he's working for Microsoft. So maybe he can take me out to dinner <laughs> if I ever run into him again. Here are just a, a bunch of kids at the science fair having a great time. Young lady here did a research project in breast cancer over in, uh, in the, oh, at Purdue. This girl worked in the chemistry department at Purdue. This boy worked in, I can't remember, this is an old, oh, nuclear engineering, uh, pharmacy department. Uh, this young man was a football player, and he worked with uh, people at Purdue in uh, health and kinesiology, and um, looking at uh, impact that players receive when they're playing football. They had some sensors, the Jeff's players, had sensors in their helmets as part of this project to measure impact flows. Um, so you can see these kids do all kinds of interesting projects. And uh, it's just amazing what they learned, and they teach me. This young lady, actually Sankari, worked in biomedical engineering and several years ago. Her project was picked to go on to the International Science and Engineering Fair. And <clears throat> this is the most recent one. Um, Sarah Cooper, she graduated last year from Jefferson High School. She made significant breakthroughs in breast cancer research at Purdue. Significant. And the project was so good she got picked to go to the International Science and Engineering Fair just this past spring. And she is just so pumped and so excited about continuing and getting a PhD and continuing her cancer <coughs> research. So, um, you know, there are a lot of really, really good jobs in the world. I, I just feel like I have one of the best. Because, like I said, 
I work with people who are fun and funny and energetic and creative and insightful, and they're teaching me things all the time. <clears throat> the future is bright. Our future in this community and in this country is in great hands. These kids are awesome. And I just wanted to, to have you see some of these kids and, and what they do. And I'm just very optimistic about the future, really. Am. So thanks for letting me come and share some of these kids and, and some of their accomplishments. Just point them in the right direction, right? And that they'll do some really amazing things. So thank you. I guess I better stop. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Do you get many students who are concerned about the issues with evolution versus... <clears throat> Some, sometimes. Sometimes. And that, that gets cleared up early on. We have an evolution unit in the biology course. And early on in the unit, I notice there are a few kids who are concerned and they have some questions and they wonder. Um, and some will even wonder, is it okay for me to learn this stuff? Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I put up on the screen a slide that shows what's called a continuum. And it's not, it wasn't my original idea. I borrowed it from somebody. And it shows at one end of the continuum, um, it's listed as creation, and the other end of the continuum is listed as evolution. And then I show another slide that fills in all the positions along the continuum that people have. Legally and professionally, it would be wrong for me to say to the kids, here's where you need to be on that continuum because this is where I am. That's, we can't do that. But they begin to see all these various viewpoints on the continuum. There's a position called, way up at the extreme end called Flat Earth creationism. There aren't many of those flat earthers around anymore, but there are some. And some of them are the uh, moon landing deniers. Okay? And then there are, move on down the continuum and you come to a position called geocentrist. Those are uh, people who believe that the, uh, the earth is the, the center of the solar system. And then young earth creationism. And then there's old earth creationism, various brands. And I briefly, briefly talk about what each of those positions is. Can't tell them to pick that where I am, but just expose them briefly. And it's professionally and legally acceptable to do that. And there's different brands of old earth creationism. There's intelligent design creationism. There's evolutionary creationism. There's theistic evolution. And the kids begin to see, it's a quick little discussion, they begin to see that Oh my gosh, there are a lot of positions on that continuum. There aren't just two. And I have literally heard kids who have grown up in good, well, in Christian homes. <clears throat> I have literally heard kids breathe a sigh of relief when they see that continuum and they quickly learn, oh, I don't have to choose because there are lots of positions on this continuum between one extreme end and the other. And that diffuses a lot. And I have found that that puts kids at ease, no matter what their background is. And I tell them, uh, briefly up front, in, in religion we, we deal with questions like, who made the universe and why? And in science we deal with questions like, how did the universe come about? And how do living things evolve over long periods of time? Science and religion deal with very different kinds of questions. And so in the minds of a lot of people, they are not in conflict with each other. There are different ways of knowing, and that seems to diffuse a lot. Science deals with questions that religion does not deal with, and vice versa. And that, that seems, to, seems to help. But that's a really good question and, and, and worthy of a long, long discussion, more time than what we have here, I guess.
telling you about this spectrum here. Yeah. Joe, we have a couple of little things. A while back, I heard that you never received an apple for the teacher. No, never. Here's oh. your apple. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. But that girl up there did bring me a cinnamon roll once. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it is our tradition to give a little gift to our speakers, and today is a very special gift. We are in a project called Eliminate to Eliminate Maternal and Neonatal Tetanus, and we have been selling note cards. You will notice on the back that these note cards are compliments of Sam Postaway. He helped us go through thousands and thousands of pictures, and we have created these note cards. And our speak and our president says, "Here is a pen for you to write." Thank you very much. 